Good morning, I'm Adam Sexton. For students and parents in New Hampshire, it feels like remote learning just ended, but preparations are underway for getting back to the classroom safely in the fall. Joining us this morning to discuss is Commissioner of Education, Frank Edelblue. Thanks for connecting with us, Commissioner. Happy to be here. Good morning, Adam. So before we look ahead, let's look back at the final three months of the last school year. Obviously, a range of experiences, some household by household, but let's focus on the kids who need the most help. Is there a sense yet of how much of a deficit some of those children are facing heading into this next school year? Yeah, so the last three months was quite an experience, I think, for everyone. Um, and I want to just take this opportunity to, again, congratulate our educators who really on a, on a moment's notice pivoted their instructional model from the in-person instructional model to remote instruction. Um, and then they worked diligently throughout the, the stay at home process um, and remote instruction in order to try and bring uh, deep and rich learning experiences to students across the state. No one had the expectation that it was gonna be perfect, uh, but we know that children are learning with or without us. And so we wanted to be part of that process. So. Uh, we believe that it was important um, that early on we engaged uh, our families and our students uh, in a way that would hopefully uh, give them some meaningful educational opportunities during that time. Um, that said, we know that uh, coming out of this um, remote instruction period, that students are going to be in different places. Uh, and there will be um, education or learning gaps. But quite frankly, learning gaps are not a crisis in an education system. In fact, that's the work that we do. Every September, with or without a pandemic, students show up, uh, they have gaps in their learning knowledge and they have things that they need to acquire and that's what we do as an education system is we fill in those gaps. So I think really what we're gonna find in September is that normally when those students come back, uh, there's a relatively small amount of variation in terms of the content knowledge for those students. They're all fairly close. Uh, there is some standard deviation, but they're fairly close in terms of that variation. Um, this year, I think when they come back, what we're going to find is that the variation in terms of the student's knowledge is going to be bigger or broader. Um, and so that is what our educators are going to be tackling when the students come back in terms of having how we uh, move all students forward. You meet them where they are and how do we move them forward? And so we've got a variety of plans in place to help with that uh, you know, circumstance on the ground as it comes in. You know, and it really, you started with assessment, but it really starts with our educators um, and making sure that they have all the right tools to be able to respond to the variation in those children. Um, we are working very closely with an organization CAST um, and a universal design for learning approach that really allows educators to differentiate their instruction, to meet kids where they are, and then move them forward from there. And we've developed a couple of different uh, professional training opportunities for educators to engage in over the summer and then into the fall to help them really uh, be able to work with students in terms of creating those formative assessments, figuring out what the student actually does have a handle on and what they maybe don't have a handle on. Uh, we will be supplementing that with work in the schools on assessment to uh, get some baseline information on students. You know, through our START task force, which I'm sure we're going to talk about at some point here, uh, one of the recommendations coming out of that was to get a baseline for where the students are, both academically as well as emotionally, um, having come out of what is uh, a fairly traumatic event uh, and experience for many people. Um, so we get that baseline, we'll know where they are, we equip our educators with good tools to be able to understand where the learning gaps are and how they can differentiate the instruction to, to meet those learning gaps. Um, and I think that we will move forward in a very positive way. And Commissioner, one of the recommendations coming out of your task force or some of the thought process around how this will work is a more hybrid model that might have some students uh, doing remote learning and other students in the classroom. Explain a little bit how this is going to work in practice district by district. Yeah. So when we come back, and, and so we fully expect to be open for in-person instruction in September. That said, we know that there are going to be some individuals, some educators, uh, some students who may have concerns, and it may be that they themselves have underlying health uh, concerns, 
or risks, or it could be that they live with somebody or know somebody who has those risks. So we wanna make sure that we can accommodate all of our staff and our students who are coming back into that learning environment. And so that would be accommodated by offering a hybrid learning opportunity for those students uh, or the educators so that they can uh, ed engage that learning um, remotely. And so that's gonna look a little bit differently in different school settings. Um, some of that may be that um, you know, we have a school district that is going to be offering in-person instruction across the board for the most for most of the students. Uh, but then they may have an educator who perhaps because of underlying health conditions can't engage back into school, but they may run a remote instruction opportunity for those students who that fits well for. Um, so it's gonna be different. And I think what you'll find is as we begin to push out some of our guidance to the school, we've uh, outlined a number of different models that are available to the districts to deploy, to be able to uh, work with um, you know, students and teachers that uh, have these concerns about underlying health, health issues. So um, I think one of the things that we've tried to do when we were you know, brainstorming and contemplating what those hybrid uh, instructional models might look like is to make sure that we don't create a circumstance where you've got educators doing double duty, uh, where they're basically teaching two classes, one in person and then another maybe in their night shift uh, online, I'm trying to make sure that we're sensitive to that and making sure that everybody has um, you know, a workload that is sustainable and that they can be successful with, both for the educators as well as for the students. And uh, we've heard some of the public health folks talk about the, the possible wisdom of adopting capacity limits, which would essentially uh, expand what you're talking about in the hybrid model to not just the folks who are afraid uh, of or worried for their own public health and, and safety, but the idea of having certain students in school on certain days and uh, other classes in session on other days. We're already seeing some colleges move along those lines. What's your perspective? perspective on that. Yeah, so depending upon what the health circumstances are on the ground in a particular community, and obviously uh, listening carefully to the guidance from Health and Human Services, if we have cohort limitations in terms of the numbers of students that we can bring into a learning environment, or we have restrictions on transportation, uh, then those are also options that we have, uh, you know, at our, uh, you know, disposal to be able to uh, continue with good, strong, deep learning um, in our instructional practices while maintaining those uh, limited cohort sizes. Um, and so we'll see how that develops as we continue to go forward through the summer. You've got a survey that shows 80% of teachers wanting to get back to the classroom. NEA New Hampshire, the teachers union statewide, has a survey saying 80% of teachers are afraid uh, for their safety, potentially, if schools go back into session. It's contradictory, but in some ways it feels like both of those things can be true at the same time. So bottom line, to what extent can you guarantee the safety of teachers this fall? Yeah, so I, I don't see those two things as being uh, contradictory at all. I, what I hear is I have uh, educators who are anxious to get back into their classrooms and spend time with their students and get into their profession, um, but they want to do it safely. And so the work that we have been doing at the START Task Force has been around how do we do that safely? So I think that those are very consistent uh, in terms of the um, you know, the messaging that, that I hear in there. And so we are listening to that and we're trying to be responsive to that in terms of, you know, the, the ideas uh, that we come up with for our local leaders. Um, because ultimately it is, you know, we'll provide a lot of guidance to our school districts, but um, as a local control state, uh, decisions about how schools are going to open will le be left mostly up to the local leaders, you know, within the framework provided to us by the governor and by Health and Human Services. Will there be enough personal protective equipment available for these schools on a daily basis? Uh, so I am not the expert in personal protective equipment, but my experience working with uh, the now retired Perry Plummer over at Homeland Security and at Department of Safety um, is that uh, initially uh, during the pandemic, the acquisition of PPE um, had some supply constraints. Uh, many of those have been overcome in the marketplace. And so a lot of PPE is available commercially uh, to our districts. And where there is not PPE that is you know, readily available in a commercial uh, supply chain or market, um, the state, work, the department working with other state agencies will step in and try to secure an, a solid supply chain so that that is available. Again, so that we can ensure the safety of our students and our staff in our instructional environment.
Yeah, and that hunt for PPE has kind of become a bit of a dog-eat-dog -dog world. It's every state for itself out there. Uh, so school districts, are, are they going to have to join that fray, essentially, or, or is the state going to try to step in to provide as much of it as possible? Again, where the PPE is not commercially available, and by commercially available, I mean that that's the, the school district it doesn't have to uh, get into a, uh, a a one district versus another fighting for a limited supply. Um, if there's limited supply, the state will engage that process to make sure that we have, have the PPE on hand to be able to execute our instructional model. Um, in circum, in, you know, we believe that across the board for most PPE items, they will be commercially available and easily accessible to our districts. It's no secret that you've wanted to reshape the way that public education works in New Hampshire in favor of a broader array of options for students. Obviously, uh, you and others believe that includes more choice when it comes to schools. Others contend that undermines the public system. Uh, from a big picture perspective, how do you think public education will look at the end of this? How do you want it to look? And uh, is this a matter of survival or is there real change that can happen here? Well, I think that everyone uh, sees what we've just gone through and knows that it was a difficult circumstance. Um, you know, some people describe this as, as home uh, education, and really I would call this as pandemic education. You know, we pivoted on a dime. Uh, you know, we put together resources really well, given the amount of time and preparation that we had to do that. Um, and so I think that that is not where we want to go. Where we want to go is towards a system that recognizes that all of our children are unique. They have different learning abilities and styles. And how do we engage those opportunities for each student so that they can find a pathway to a real bright future? Um, what we wanted, one of the things that the pandemic has kind of revealed to us is that we've had a number of students who, and this is from the survey data, number of students who felt increased levels of anxiety and stress throughout the pandemic. Uh, when I look at that kind of a response, I'm like, of course, many adults felt the same way. Uh, but then we also had not an insignificant number of students who felt a degree of freedom. So students maybe who in the traditional school environment were suffering from social anxiety or depression. Uh, when they had some more autonomy and they had a little bit more control over their schedule uh, through the remote instruction, they found some relief and really engaged that model um, and, and thrived in it. And so what we wanna be careful of is that we want to move forward in a positive direction. What can we learn from the process that we just went through to improve opportunities for our students, for our families, and for our teachers as well. All right, Commissioner Edelblue, thank you so much for joining us on Close Up this Sunday morning. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Adam.